Hello class, this is a PowerPoint presentation that I put together of actually doing a pre-trip using a camera so you can have a visual on the various aspects of the fire apparatus that you will inspect. First class, I stand at the front of the vehicle and I get an overall general impression of the vehicle. And what I'm looking for is the vehicle leaning to one side or the other. I bend down, I look underneath the vehicle to see if I see any fluid leaks. Next, I examine underneath the vehicle in more detail to see if there's any transmission fluid leaks, oil fluid leaks, radiator fluid leaks. I also check the drip rate of the pump to make sure that it's not excessively leaking. Then I look at the top of the apparatus at the clearance lights. I make sure those lights are clean, that they're securely mounted, they're not broken, and by law they have to be amber to the front. Next, I, can, I continue to look at the front, but I move down to look at the headlights and the turn signals. I make sure that the lenses are clean, that the lights are securely mounted, and none of the lenses appear to be broken or missing. Then I look at the reflectors on the side, and I make sure they're clean. If they're not clean, I take a shop rag and wipe off the road grime. I make sure they're securely mounted. They're not broken. And since they're on the front of the vehicle to comply with the DOT, they have to be amber in color. Then I look at the windshield wipers. Okay. I, I also look at the windshield to make sure it's clean that there's no illegal stickers blocking the view of the driver, there's no obstructions, and there's no damage to the glass or the seal around the edges of the glass. Then I take a look and I inspect the wipers. I pull the tension on the wipers to make sure it has adequate tension. I make sure that each wiper is securely mounted, that it's not damaged. I make sure that the wiper blade itself is flexible and it has not hardened and I make sure that they operate smoothly. One note of caution is that you do not want to operate the windshield wipers on a dry windshield. Now I get down underneath the front of the truck and the first thing I take a look at is the steering box and you can see a picture here that I took. This is an actual steering box on a type 1 fire apparatus. I make sure that it is securely mounted, it's not cracked, and there's no power steering fluid leaking in and around the steering box. I continue to look at the steering box and I look at the hoses and the couplings. I make sure that there's no leaks. I make sure that the hoses are not damaged or frayed or against any moving part, and I make sure that they are all securely mounted. Then I move down and I look at the steering linkage. Here's a picture of the steering linkage. I look at the connecting links, the connecting arms, and the rods, and I make sure they are not worn or cracked. I look at the tassel nuts. I make sure the tassel nuts are in place, that the cotter key is in the tassel nut, and I make sure none of the rubber bushings are worn or missing, and I make sure the entire steering linkage is securely mounted. Then I take a look at the front suspension leaf springs. I make sure that the leaf springs are intact, that they haven't shifted, they're not cracked, or any broken leaf springs. What I do is I take a look around the U-bolt clamps and I make sure I don't see any shiny parts because uh, anything that's shiny around those clamps would indicate that the leaf springs are loose. I make sure they're not cracked. I make sure that the U-bolts are fastened to the frame 
and also fasten to the leaf springs. Next, I take a look at the spring mounts. I make sure that um, they're not cracked around the frame where they're bolted to the frame. They're not damaged. I look at the spring hangers. I look at the bushings, the U-bolts, and other axle mounting parts to make sure I see no evidence of any moving by uh, looking for shiny metal. A lot of times this area will receive damage when the front axle is overweight and over a period of time, the metal around where you see the bolts that hold the spring mount, they start to crack. Then I take a look at the shock absorbers on the front axle. I want to make sure that they're securely fastened both to the frame and to the axle. I want to make sure they're not leaking and that they're securely mounted. I'm also looking to make sure the rubber bushings at the top and the bottom where the uh, nuts hold the shock absorber to the bolt, that that is intact and no evidence of any cracks. Next, I look at the slack adjuster on the front steer axle. I make sure that nothing is broken, loose, or no parts are missing. And remember, with the brakes released, the push rod on the slack adjuster should not move more than one inch of travel. If you also remember from previous lecture, the best way to check the adjustment on the slack adjuster is to chalk the wheels, release the brakes. Once the air pressure settles, tell the driver to step on the brake and hold it. And that slack adjuster rod should not extend more than an inch and three quarters. If it extends more than an inch and three quarters from the chamber, then the brakes are considered out of adjustment and the vehicle needs to be taken out of service. Now I look at the actual brake chamber itself. I make sure that the brake chamber is not leaking, it's not cracked or dented, and that it is securely mounted to the axle. Then I take a look at the brake hoses and the lines, and I, make, I look for anything that's cracked, worn, or leaky hoses, lines, and couplings. I also make sure that the hose is not rubbing against any moving part under the fire apparatus. Now I take a look at the front brake drum uh, linings or uh, disc pads. I make sure there's no cracks or dents, nothing is loose or missing. I make sure that the lining is not less than a quarter inch thick, if it is, then the vehicle is taken out of service. I also make sure that the, in this case, looking at the drum or the disc brake, I wanna make sure the rotor is not warped due to excessive heat. Then I move to the outside and I look at the tire, or I'm sorry, I look at the rim. While I'm looking at the rim, I'm making sure it's not bent there's no cracks or damage to the rims, and there's absolutely no weld repairs. I'm also looking between the lug nuts, especially on aluminum wheels, to make sure that there's no hairline cracks. I also make sure that the lug nut itself has it worn through the aluminum, and, is, and I also make sure that the wheel is on tight and there's no missing lug nuts. Then I take a look at the hub grease seal to make sure there's no evidence of leaking. I look at the front of the wheel and then I look at behind the wheel. Remember, leaky gear oil can get onto the disc pads or the brake pads and cause a loss of friction, which means that you can set yourself up for a catastrophic, catastrophic brake failure. When I look at the tires, I remember CID, meaning condition, inflation, and depth. I look at the overall condition of the tire to make sure that I don't see any bulges on the sidewalls. I make sure that there's even tread wear. I check the inflation of the tire. You can get the proper inflation from the manufacturer's owner's manual, or you can look on the sidewall of the tire 
and it'll tell you what the inflation of that particular tire should be. Since this is on the steer axle, the depth of the tread should be no less than 430 seconds all the way across, even tread wear. I'm also looking to see if there's any uneven tread wear, which would indicate a possible alignment problem. All right, reviewing the front wheel tires. On the condition, I would check the tread for even wear. I'd also check the tread and sidewall for cuts or damage. And again, during the inflation check, I would look at the side wall of the tire to see what the manufacturer of the tire recommends for pressure. I'd also take a look at the valve stem and make sure that the cap is on the stem and that the stem is easily accessible uh, to check the air pressure. Tread depth, since this is a steer axle, once again, I want you to take a tread depth gauge and check to make sure that you have a minimum tread depth of 430 seconds. If there is less than 430 seconds of rubber on the steer axle, the vehicle needs to be taken out of place until the tires can be repaired. Lug nuts. Make sure when you look at the front wheel that all the lug nuts are present. There's no cracks in between the lug nuts. There's no signs of looseness, meaning rust striations coming out in a spider web form from the nut. And make sure that the bolt holes are not cracked. Okay, the driver exterior area, like the door and the mirror. As far as the door is concerned, I open and close the door to make sure it latches properly. I look for any damage to the door. I also look at the door hinges and the seals to make sure they're not damaged and they're intact. Next, I look at the mirror. I put my hand on the mirror bracket. I'm looking at the mirror to ensure it's clean clear and it's not broken or cracked and I also want to make sure that the bracket is securely attached both at the top of the door and right below the window. Then I move to the battery compartment. I look at the battery box to make sure that both the box and the battery is securely mounted. I make sure all the cell caps are present if they're equipped with cell caps. I look at the connections to make sure that they're tight I also make sure I look at the battery post to make sure there's no excessive corrosion that would cause the vehicle not to start. I look at the battery box itself to make sure that the cover and door are secure and capable of latching so we can keep the battery door closed during transport. Underneath the vehicle, I take a look at the drive shaft. I make sure it's not cracked, not bent. I also make sure that the couplings are securely mounted and free of any foreign objects. I also look at the U-joint itself to make sure that there's no debris, rocks, cans, or anything else that would be stuck that would cause a catastrophic failure on your fire apparatus. Then I look at the exhaust system. I start at the engine and I go all the way back to the tailpipe. I'm checking for damage and leaks as indicated by carbon or rust. Okay, a pinhole leak would be easy to find because you'd see soot striations coming from where the leak is. Anytime you discover an exhaust leak on fire apparatus, it needs to be taken out of service because there's a pretty good chance that carbon monoxide and other poisonous gases can get up into the crew area. You also want to make sure that the exhaust um, pipe is securely mounted and fastened to the frame. Next, I look at the longitudinal frame of the fire apparatus. I make sure there's no cracks, no broken wells or damage Okay, to the frame members, the cross members, the box itself, or the floor. Now I'm at the rear of the apparatus. I'm looking at the leaf springs. I'm looking for anything missing, shifted, cracked, or broken leaf springs. Again, loose leaf springs would be indicated by shiny uh, metal where the leaf would be moved, working itself back and forth. 
I take a look at the spring mounts. I look for anything that's cracked or damaged spring hangers, bushings, U-bolts, or other axle mounting parts to make sure that there's nothing damaged, bent, or missing, or broken. Then I look at the rear shock absorbers. Again, I want to make sure that the shock absorber is securely mounted, both to the, at the top and the bottom. The rubber bushings are in place, both uh, nuts where the shock absorber screws into the frame and to the axle. I also want to make sure that it is securely mounted to the frame as well. If your vehicle does not have rear shock absorbers, then state during the pre-trip that there is no rear shock absorber. Some vehicles have shock absorber suspension in the rear. Some commercial vehicles have airbags and some just have a leaf spring suspension. Take a look at the rear brake slack adjuster while I'm underneath there. Make sure there's nothing broken, loose, or missing. And with the brakes released, the push rod should not have more than one inch of travel. And if you remember, the best way to inspect the brakes for adjustment is put the vehicle in neutral, shut the engine off, chalk two tires, release the brake, and then have the driver step on the brake. The slack adjuster rod should extend no more than two inches from the brake chamber once the brakes are applied. If the slack adjuster rod extends more than two inches from the brake chamber, the vehicle should be taken out of service because the brakes are out of adjustment. There's the rear brake chamber. Make sure there's nothing leaking, cracked, or dented, and it is securely mounted to the axle. Next, take a look at the brake hoses and the air lines, looking for anything that's cracked, worn, or leaky hose lines and couplings. Also, make sure none of the air lines and the brake lines are rubbing against any moving parts underneath the, the fire apparatus. Take a look at the, uh, the brake linings. Okay, if they have rotors and drums on the back, make sure there's no cracks or dents, nothing uh, loose or missing. Make sure there's no evidence of uh, oil leak. The linings should not be less than a quarter inch thick. If the drum, if the brake linings or the brake drum linings, brake pads are less than a quarter inch thick, the vehicle should be taken out of service and new pads should be put on. Let's take a look at the rear wheels. Okay, look at the rims, make sure nothing is bent. There's no cracks or damage to the rims and no weld repairs. Take a look at the rear axle seals. Make sure there's no evidence of any leaking. And if the axle has a sight glass, check the oil level. Oil level is 8090 gear oil. Also make sure you check behind the wheel to make sure there's no evidence of uh, oil leaking that may uh, get on the brake pads and cause a catastrophic, a catastrophic brake failure. Again, take a look at the rear tires and remember CID, condition, inflation, and depth. Take a look at the condition of the tire. Check the tread for even wear. Check the tread for sidewall for cuts or damage. Next, check the tire inflation. All right, check the valve stem to make sure that both the inside dual and the outside tire valve stem is accessible to be able to check the air pressure. The air pressure, the proper amount of air pressure should be in the owner's manual or on the side of the tire. Next, check the tread depth. Here, the law is a little bit different on the rear axle tires. The minimum tread depth on the rear tires or on your trailer tires should be no less than 230 seconds of rubber. If they're less than 230 seconds of rubber, the vehicle needs to be taken out of service. Take a look at the lug nuts on the rear wheels. Make sure they're all present. There's no cracks. There's no signs of looseness as evidenced by rust striations coming out in the form of a spider web from each nut. And make sure the bolt holes are not cracked or worn through from putting the bolts on too tight. Look at the duels. Make sure there's nothing between the tires that can become a missile when the tires start to turn. Make sure the tires aren't touching each other. 
If they are touching each other, the vehicle needs to be taken out of service. When the tires touch each other due to underinflation, it causes friction and which ca can cause a tire fire. Make sure that the space between the tires is even and that the tires are the same size. Okay, there are three things required, three pieces of safety equipment that are required in all commercial vehicles, including fire apparatus. You should have spare electrical fuses, and you should have three reflective triangles, and you must have a fire extinguisher. So make sure your fire apparatus has elect, uh, spare electrical fuses, at least three reflective triangles or three cones, and at least one fire extinguisher. When you look for that fire extinguisher, make sure you um, check the fire extinguisher to ensure that there's no debris stuck up inside the hose. The fire extinguisher is fully charged and make sure that it's appropriately rated for ABC. At the rear of the vehicle, you wanna make sure that the lenses on the lights are clean, secured, and they're not broken. Next, take your shop rag and look at the reflectors on the rear of the vehicle. They should be clean, secured to the vehicle, not broken, and red in color. If they appear to be dull due to road grime, take your shop rag and wipe the reflectors clean. Next, take a look at the compartment doors. Make sure they open, close, and latch properly. DOT regulations require all commercial vehicles to have mud guards or mud flaps. Make sure that they're not damaged and that they're securely mounted. While you're underneath the vehicle, take a look at the fuel tank. Make sure that you see no leaks, there's no damage, and it's securely mounted. If you look at this fuel tank here, you'll see two straps that are holding it to the frame. You wanna make sure when you look at those straps that you see no evidence of shiny metal, which would indicate that the tank is loose and not securely mounted. Next, take a look at the fuel cap. Make sure that it's securely attached. Unscrew the fuel cap. And when you look at this fuel cap here, you'll see like four little circles on the fuel cap itself. Those are escape vents. And those vents pop open in case the fire apparatus is involved in a T-bone type collision. Those caps would pop open and would relieve the pressure to prevent the fuel tank from exploding upon impact. During the pre-trip inspection, I highly recommend you remove the fuel cap, take your shop rag, and make sure that the inside of that cap is clean and that there's no oil buildup or dirt or grime buildup that may prevent those caps from activating upon impact. Once you've cleaned the inside of the fuel cap, then secure it back on to the fuel tank. Next, take a look at in the engine compartment and let's check the oil level. Locate the dipstick, check the oil level. While you're looking at the oil level, notice the color of it, notice the smell of it. Notice if there's any milky substance or any metal shavings in the oil. Then locate the coolant level and it should have a sight glass. Look, in, look at the sight glass and you should see coolant in the sight glass. If you can't see coolant in the sight glass, then you need to add the appropriate amount of radiator fluid, the type that's recommended by the manufacturer. Then I would check the windshield washer fluid and I would inspect the sight glass and if it needs, then I would add the recommended type of fluid. You can see here the sight glass uh, for the coolant level. If the engine is cool, remove the radiator cap and then go ahead and add the coolant. Power steering fluid. 
check the fluid level, check the color of the fluid. Take a look at the belts. All right. Again, you would check the belts for cracks, frays, or damage. Check the snugness. At the center of the belt, you should be able to um, squeeze the belt no more than three-quarter inch deflection at the center of the belt to ensure that the belts are properly adjusted. Anything more than a three-quarter inch deflection would require adjustment by a mechanic. I'd also make sure the belts are all uh, there and in place and are not rubbing against any other moving parts. Next, I would examine the air compressor. I'd look at the air compressor to make sure that it's uh, nothing is missing, broken, and it's securely mounted into the engine compartment. I'd look at the air lines, making sure that they're all connected, and then I'd listen for any air leaks. Next, I'd look at the water pump. I'd make sure that it was uh, securely mounted, it wasn't damaged. I'd also look at the radiator fan to make sure that there was no evidence of any damage. I'd also check the area for any leaks of coolant. Next, I'd look at the alternator. I'd see if it was belt driven or gear driven. I'd make sure that it was securely fastened to the engine and nothing was missing, broken or damaged. Next, I'd take a look at the power steering unit, all right, and I'd make sure that it was securely mounted, I, nothing was broken, missing, or damaged. I'd also look at the area for any fluid leaks. If any of those components are gear-driven, then during the pre-trip inspection, you have to mention that they are gear-driven. You will know that they're gear-driven when you see no belts. Next, I'd, oh, I'd check all the hoses. I'd look for puddles and or dripping fluid in and around the engine compartment underneath the fire apparatus. I would look at the condition of all the hoses and I'd check that the couplings and hose clamps are tight and nothing was broken, missing, or damaged. Next, I'd hop up into the cab and I would adjust the seat. You would adjust the seat first before you do anything else in the cab. After I adjust the seat, I would check the seat belt to make sure it's securely mounted and that it still works and it can adjust properly and making sure that the latch and release work properly as well. Next, I would get in the driver's seat and after adjusting my seat, I would check the mirror adjustment. The mirror adjustment, you'll know the mirrors are properly adjusted, is when you could sit up right in your seat with both hands on the steering wheel, lean back about a quarter inch, and you should see a little bit of the rear of your fire apparatus. I will also be handing out a mirror adjustment guide uh, at the next class meeting. Next, I would look at the inside of the windshield. I'd make sure it's clean, no illegal stickers, no obstructions, and no damage. Also note, during the pre-trip inspection, the dash area should be clear of any materials that could become a missile should an accident occur. Next, I would uh, check my turn signal indicator. I'd turn the left turn signal on I'd see that the indicator would work on the dash. Then I would turn the right turn signal on and check the turn indicator to see if it's working. Next, I would activate the four-way flashers to make sure that the uh, four-way flasher indicator on the dash was working properly. Next, I would check the headlight indicators. I check the high beam indicator, the low beam indicator. And if you are taking a pre trip inspection test at the DMV, then the examiner will assist in checking the vehicle lights and indicators as well. Next, I would check the horn. I would test the electric horn on the steering wheel, and I'd also check the air horn as well. Next, I would check the heater defroster. I'd test that the heater and the defroster both work properly by turning it on and turning it off. 
Then I would start the engine. If it's a manual transmission, you depress the clutch first, keep the clutch to the floor, and then start the engine. I would place the gear shift lever in neutral, turn on the ignition switch, and then I would start the engine. So uh, to re refresh your memory, I would depress the clutch, put the vehicle in neutral, and then start the engine. After the engine starts, in about 30 seconds, I'd release the clutch slowly. Now I would check my gauges. I would check the oil pressure gauge to make sure that it has an adequate amount of pressure. I'd check the engine water temperature gauge to make sure that it's working. I check that the alternator is charging. At this time, I would check my steering wheel for free play. With the engine running, with power steering, check the steering play. The steering wheel play should not exceed 10 degrees or about two inches of travel on a 20 inch steering wheel. Most commercial vehicles and fire apparatuses come equipped with a 20 inch steering wheel. If it exceeds two inches or 10 degrees, the vehicle should be taken out of service and repaired. Now we start the parking brake check. So with the parking brake set and the vehicle in a forward gear, the vehicle should not move. You do not accelerate. It's at idle speed. Try to move the vehicle against the parking brake. The foot must be off the service brake pedal. Now you can use an acronym called COLA, C meaning the air compressor cut in, O meaning when the air compressor cuts out, L when the low pressure warning device comes on, and A is the air leakage rate. Let's take a look at the cut in test. Notice this vehicle here on the screen has two gauges, the primary braking system and the secondary braking system. You'll start with the air compressor off and the engine at idle. Okay, the air pressure gauge should not be moving, indicating the air tanks are full and the compressor is off. Then you start to pump the brake. You reduce the air tank pressure enough to cause the compressor to cut in or turn on. The air compressor must cut in no lower than 85 PSI. Now we want to see when the air compressor will cut out. So we will increase the engine to a fast idle, wait for the air compressor to cut off or shut off. The normal cutout pressure for the air compressor is 110 to 120 PSI with a maximum cutout pressure of about 130. And what this means is it's that little air governor that tells the compressor when to start pumping air and when to stop pumping air. So the cut-in test is we want to see when the air governor will tell the air compressor to start building air. And the cut-out test is when the air governor tells the air compressor when to stop pumping air. Okay, now we want to do the air leak test. So with the engine shut off, with a fully charged air system, all brakes are released, the service and the maxi brake. Then we're going to apply a full steady pressure to the brake pedal for one minute. You will start the minute once the air gauge settles. After the initial pressure drop, the air pressure must not drop more than 3 PSI. If you have a combination vehicle like a tiller, then it's no more than 4 PSI. The final brake, air brake check is the low pressure warning signal. This is conducted with the engine shut off and the ignition switch on. Then the driver will reduce the air tank pressure enough to cause the low air warning device to activate. NFPA states the warning device on fire apparatus should activate somewhere between 55 and 75 PSI. 
DOT in California state law states that the low air warning device should activate at no less than 60 PSI. Okay class, hopefully this little presentation gives you an idea on how to conduct a pre-trip inspection on commercial vehicles and fire apparatus. If you have any questions regarding the information I covered in this presentation, please feel free to give me a call on my cell phone or you can email me at jbreakbill at cmccd.edu. Thank you. This concludes the pre-trip presentation.